Good afternoon. Um, so how is everybody doing today? Good afternoon. Pretty okay. Yeah. Yourself? Uh, one second. One second. I had another meeting earlier today where I didn't have to talk, so I actually took my headset off and ran the sound through my computer speakers and I forgot to switch them back. So, um, so glad to hear that folks are doing well. Um, I am about to go stir crazy. Uh, lockdown has not been friendly to me. Also, I'm almost out of food and I'm not looking forward to uh, a trip to the grocery store. Um, but such is life. Um, so I want to start with uh, a quick administrative note, which I don't know what you guys are doing or how much time you're spending um, prepping for tutorials. Um, and that's not my business. You're managing your studies as you see fit. But this week, the tutorial question requires you to spend some time before you walk in. And the way that the lesson is structured, um, it's going to be very important for you to be on time for the tutorial. So I've said this on numerous occasions. I will continue to say this. You are allowed to have things in your life that are a higher priority than this class for you. I do not judge you for that. I do not uh, give you a hard time for that. That is your choice. The consequences that flow on from that are also yours. Okay. Um, but this week only, well, this week, and no promises that I won't say this again for future weeks, but this week, if you do not have time to prep before the tutorial, or if something happens and you can't be in the waiting room at the start of the tutorial, just go ahead and, and don't come this week. Watch a recording. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You're not, I'm not going to give you a hard time about it. You have my permission. Okay. Um, and certainly if you decide to roll in 10 or 15 minutes late, uh, despite me saying this, right, that's fine. We'll sort it out and, and manage it as best we can. But your life will be more difficult. Your classmates' lives will be more difficult. Just go ahead and take, you know, go ahead and and uh, and take the L this week if your if if your tech blows up on you and you can't make it on time. Okay. Um, it's going to be a very small L. Don't have to worry about it. Um, all right. So with that out of the way, okay, the topic of today's lecture is remoteness. And if you did the reading for this week, and at the end of doing the reading, you reached the conclusion that you can't really tell the difference between causation and remoteness, um, congratulations. Uh, this is basically where I was when we discussed this topic in my torts class when I was in law school. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, after reading the materials myself and reading other things that you were not asked to read, uh, I am not completely convinced that I have gone significantly further in my understanding of remoteness as a discrete concept. So here is our best effort uh, at trying to 
figure out why courts talk about remoteness as being separate from causation. The remoteness analysis asks the question of foreseeability. Foreseeability, okay? And, and we've touched on this a couple of times as we keep coming around, right? And I think that one of the things that uh, I hope that you're learning is that um, the structure of a torts analysis is very artificial and pieces that we've already discussed keep cropping up later in the analysis. And you know, you'll recall that for the past several weeks, I've been going, oh, we're gonna talk about that later. We're gonna talk about that later. And you can see how this is an integrated whole. And it's not a clean, there's not a clean separation between the steps of torts. And remoteness is sort of the, the best example of this. So we don't hold people responsible for all the harm that follows from their negligence, right? We, we, don't, we don't sort of follow the consequences of a negligent act all the way down to the point where, uh, you know, we're not, we're not holding people responsible for the torts of their great grandparents. Only the harms that are foreseeable consequences of the negligent act are subject to liability. Okay. This raises the question of what constitutes foreseeable harm. And there are three questions that uh, we see when we look at the cases from the courts applying uh, English precedents, right? Including here in the Caribbean um, for those courts that are still subject to the jurisdiction of uh, the Privy Council um, and the CCJ, okay? So the first of these three questions is were the external factors a reasonably foreseeable source of danger? Now, if you're asking what external factors, I don't remember us talking about external factors. That's fair, right? Because we haven't. In our discussions, what is referred to by external factors here is the actual instrument of harm, okay? So if you think back to the wagon mound case. The external factors in that case would be the oil that the ship discharged or the hot metal that they were welding that sparked the oil and caused the fire, okay? Um, in Cook v. Lewis, the Canadian simultaneous cause case, right? The external factor would be the guns that the hunters were carrying. It's the thing that actually causes the harm, all right? You'll recall from uh, the very beginning of Professor Cotellini's book that the vast majority of tort litigation in the Caribbean has to do with car accidents and um, the uh, external factor in a car accident is of course the car, okay? So, you know, when asking this first question, is this a reasonably foreseeable source of danger? The answer is usually pretty simple and straightforward, okay? Car, absolutely a reasonably foreseeable source of danger. You know, a cucumber, maybe not, right? In that you would not expect a cucumber to be something that uh, causes harm, okay? There are exceptions, right? So for example, if your negligence in, you know, cutting up the cucumber <laughs> leads to someone choking to death, okay? Maybe, the cu maybe that's a reasonably foreseeable source of danger. Um, maybe if the plaintiff has a cucumber allergy, right? 
also a reasonably foreseeable source of danger. But in general, your intuition will probably guide you correctly on this one, right? If it's if you look at the at the instrument and you go, yeah, okay, people could get hurt with this. You're probably going to be right. Okay. What questions do you have about this first question, this first thing that judges analyze? Excuse me, I was falling asleep this afternoon, so I got a cup of tea. Um, what questions do you have about this? Yes, go ahead, Sally Ann. Oh, when, when we're looking at remoteness, we have to link it to foreseeability. That's what you're saying? Yes. Uh, so that means that you have to be able to, uh, if it is something that you could not foresee, then you would say that it was remote. Yes, yes, that's that's the answer. And, that's, and that is the analysis that the... Um, that their lordships undertook in the wagon mound case, right? If you'll recall, this was sort of a, a Rube Goldberg machine situation where there were lots of moving parts that led to the damage to the wharf and their lordship said, no one could have foreseen that this would happen, okay. right? So um, any, what other questions are there? Okay. Nothing else. All right. Yeah, I have a question. So, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I think I just answered my own question before um, I asked it to you. Um, Fantastic. Before. I always, I always love being able to help you in those situations. But I was saying because I was about to say or about to ask if it's foreseeable but unavoidable, and then I was like, if it's unavoidable then is it, a, do you as I mean? Because I would imagine that if, if the, if it is foreseeable, but everything is set in motion for the action, for whatever damage to occur, and you can't do anything about it, if it will still be like remote. Do you understand? Well, I guess, I guess in that situation, I would be asking what's the breach of duty? Um, because if, if there's, if the damage is completely unavoidable, then I'm not sure that the that whatever breach of duty happened is a but for cause. Does that make sense? Yeah, because that's when I was asking you the question. When I said but sir, I was like, wait, shoot, if it unavoidable, then yeah, it's that same thing that you just came to. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So since there's not, since there doesn't seem to be any more questions on this. Uh, we're going to move on. The second question that judges ask, right? So remember we said there are three questions that are part of this analysis. Here's the second one. Was the way in which the external factor caused the damage reasonably foreseeable? Okay. And what this is asking is that the judges are asking if there's anything sort of weird or unusual about the events that would suggest that the link between the negligence and the injury was too remote, okay? So there's a couple of examples um, from the mid 20th century that are instructive, okay? In Hughes versus Lord Advocate, uh, we have this uh, work site at an open sewer and they have danger, there's oil lamps at the, at the work site. Um, and it's not secure enough, right? They're, they haven't blocked off access well enough. Um, a child gets into the work site, lowers a lamp into the sewer, breaks the lamp, <laughs> and the oil spill that results from that causes an explosion and he falls into the sewer and is injured. Okay, so in this case, their lordships held that 
absolutely, it's foreseeable that you know there was negligence and the there was foreseeable. Uh, the lamp was a foreseeable source of danger, but that danger that the lamp presented was the danger of getting burned, either by the lamp itself because it's hot or by the oil in the event that it spilled. It's, uh, it's not foreseeable that the lamp would have caused an explosion and then that the child falls in. So the question is, was the way in which the external factor caused the damage reasonably foreseeable? Was the way in which the external factor caused the damage reasonably foreseeable? And on the other side of the case, right, we have the Doty versus Turner case. This one's a very weird case. Um, we have a cauldron of molten metal and the uh, at, a, at a work site. And the workers are attempting to cover the cauldron with an asbestos lid. Okay. Um, they screw up and they slip the lid, the asbestos lid, into the cauldron. Now, you may think, you may look at this and go, oh, it's reasonably foreseeable that the lid would cause the metal to splash and that might burn someone. And you would be absolutely correct about that, except that's not what happened. What happened was that the entry of the asbestos caused a chemical reaction in the metal and it bubbled over like a volcano. Now, it seems to me that if you're reading, if you're looking at these facts through the Hughes lens, you would expect to find no liability because this is not the foreseeable, uh, th this is not the foreseeable way in which damage would have occurred. Um, but that's not what their lordships held. Their lordships held that there was liability because, because, excuse me, um, because the chemical reaction should have been foreseeable. Like you should have known what, what would have happened when you introduced these substances to each other in these conditions. And, um, and so that's how their lordships distinguished these two cases. Um, and you are absolutely uh, correct that if there's, if it's not foreseeable, right? If the if something weird happens, no liability. Okay, and and if this sounds similar to the analysis we were talking about last week when we talked about intervening causes or superseding causes, um, yeah, Ward, you're absolutely right. The Daphnis test. Um, if this sounds like something that, if this sounds similar, that's because it is very similar, okay? Um, so I have a private message. Um, was it something that happened before or was it something that was expected? I think if I remember correctly, their, the Lord, their Lordship's answer was basically, um, you know, the testimony is that this is, you know, this is a known chemical reaction. It wasn't like this wasn't something that was unexpected. Um, it's just that none of the people who were involved in the process were a chemist. And so none of them knew that this would happen. So do, does that answer your question to the person who, who private messaged me?
Yes, sir, but it doesn't make sense in my opinion. I mean, I tend to agree with you, um, but I will say I will say this, and that, and this is exactly what my constitutional law professor said to a student on the first day of class when they said, "Well, it just seems it seems like uh, it seems like the Supreme Court really got this wrong." And, and this is what my, my professor said. He said, you are all brilliant, intelligent, and articulate people with really interesting opinions about the Constitution, and I do not care because you are not one of the nine people who sits on the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, now, I take a slightly different approach because I absolutely care about your opinions because one of my goals in this class is to give you the tools that you can go out and identify these cases that make no sense and can work to change them, okay? Um, but in order to do that, you have to understand the reasoning for the status Sir? quo as it is. Ward, I've Sir? seen your hand. Go ahead, go ahead. What's up? Oh, ahead, sorry. Lord. I was asking is, is, could it be because the um the burden of proof is different um between the crim and the tort? Could that be the case? Because I know on the criminal liability, they would not have gotten off um because they didn't know what was going on. They wouldn't have gotten off like that. Um, so I'm asking if the difference has to do has anything. Um, well, uh, first, of, well, I mean, I'm not. You you mean the difference between um the Doty case and the and the uh, Hughes case or the difference between my approach to torts and my con law professors approach? No, no the, case, the cases that you mentioned. Okay, uh, so the answer is that um, the um, the difference I think between, I, I don't think it's a, it's a crim versus tort case at all because both of these are torts cases, okay? Um, no, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I was making a relation to the crim because I'm saying that under criminal oh, law, they, they, would, they would not have, they would not have escaped liability. I'm asking in, because I'm asking if in, the difference is due to the burden of proof, the difference in burden of proof. Okay. So let me, let me, let me clarify one thing. In the Doty case, they did not escape liability. The, you, if you were applying the Hughes logic, you would expect them to escape liability, but they did not. Okay. That was, and that, that was why. That was why their lordships had to make the um, the the weird logic of saying, "Well, look, you know, chemists understand that this is a thing that happens, so you should have known." Okay, um, so so they did not they did not get off the hook in the Doty case. In the Hughes case, um, you know, I I honestly am not sure how that case would have come out in in the criminal context um, without giving it some more thought. Uh, so, um, what other questions do you guys have about this piece of the puzzle? Hi, so I have a couple. Go ahead, Go ahead Michael. So, with the the second case, the Dodi case, which that's the one, right? Um, so, yeah. Go ahead. Right. In my mind, when you were talking about the cover falling and splashing, right, and then you spoke about the reaction and how that made a difference. I, I don't see how it does because if it splashes or if it goes over like a volcano or whatever the case may be, the point is the the metal is coming out the same way. So I felt like like um that was kind of irrelevant in that sense. You understand what I mean? Yeah, and I think um I think that their lordships would agree with you, right? Which is why they found the um the the work site liable. The employer liable. Uh, the issue that you run into is how do we square the circle of the Hughes case where the difference between getting burned on a on a lamp versus falling because of an explosion caused by the lamp, like these are regarded as two different ways of being harmed one is foreseeable the other is not 
And then in the Doty case, we have a splash versus a, you know, an eruption. And both of these are foreseeable. Like that's the, that's the issue that I think we run into is how do we distinguish between these two situations and, um, and their lordships took the position that you distinguish between them because the eruption is a known and knowable consequence and uh, an exploding oil lamp uh, is not, if you believe that, right? That last, that last statement sounds really, really sketchy. Every Honestly, time I, right? say I was just gonna say that because in my <laughs> mind I was like, is it really that unforeseeable for real? Like, because in my mind, that the first case, I got I need to remember these names. Sorry, please forgive me. I've had a very long day. But the Hughes case. Right, the Hughes case. Because in my mind, when you were talking about those facts just now, I was like, So is it in this area, um, in this environment that doesn't really happen? Because I felt that that was a reasonably foreseeable thing too. So in my mind, does it really just depend on what the judge deems to be reasonably reasonably foreseeable? And then in the and in in a lot of instances, there are um there are products or whatever the case may be that may that sometimes even in the labels they say that it could result to something or whatever, but in most instances they don't. So in my mind. Is it a matter or is the reasonability being judged on the nature of the product or just the probability of it happening, even though it can actually happen, but doesn't really happen? You understand what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think that you sort of hit on it very early in in your comments when you you said, you know, is it just whatever the judge thinks is reasonably foreseeable? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And I think that this is one of those things where it sort of illustrates the importance of um, having a diverse bench, right? So we want judges who, you know, are former utility workers, right? Um, maybe we even want to build a system where, like, lay people come in and participate in the fact-finding process. Maybe not like a traditional jury, like a, a common law jury that we're familiar with in the criminal context, but um, there are a number of countries where in civil torts, uh, lay judges sit as part of the decision-making process. And there's always a law judge, but there's, there's lay people as well maybe these are systems that we should be considering. Um, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I think you're, I think you're absolutely asking the right kinds of questions. So, yeah, Rudolph, exactly. What a reasonable man would have seen, you know, these are what constitutes a reasonable man, right? Is a reasonable man, um, you know, somebody who uh, grew up in whole town and graduated from, uh, you know, Queens or Harrison, and then uh, went to UE on law, went to Hugh Wooding, um, you know, joined, uh, joined a major chambers, and then went on the bench. Like, is that the life experience that should be the sum total of the judiciary? I was just literally going to say something like that because in my mind, the, the idea of a reasonable man is so weird because people um, people constitute what is reasonable based on what they have experienced. And I feel like it would serve, to, uh, it would serve better to draw that conclusion based on the nature of a particular situation rather than what the reasonable man will foresee. What I mean to say is, if for example, we go back to the oil lab and it is, and because of the nature of that product, it could have that effect. I feel like that should be what should be taken into consideration more than what the reasonable man would see because if the reasonable man has never had an oil lamp explode, then there's no reason for him to believe that this is, that um, it, then there is, reason sorry for him to believe that 
it exponent is an unforeseeable thing when really and truly that's just the nature of the product. Yeah, and this is this is um that's not what it is. All right, so what is it then, Rudolph? I I keep going back to the Wangi monkeys because for me that is the benchmark. Mm -hmm. So men are welding. That perhaps that's what they do every day. Mm -hmm. That's their job. But here at this particular day, there's a ship park out there. There's some oil on the floor. Now, it is foreseeable in any circumstance that sparks will fly as long as you are welding. It is the obvious thing to foresee. Sparks fly whenever you are melting any. So that's a given. What in the Magman case they are saying is, if there is oil, which is flammable, again, again, that is foreseeable. Sparks with something flammable, it is not only foreseeable, it is obvious that a flame would ignite from such. What to me was not foreseeable was the fact that a ship crossed the road that would have been damaged. But yet they are saying in that case, yes, because as long as you have flames, it has the propensity to get out of control and where it goes, and that was the problem. You see what they were saying, is that you, you you overlook the propensity of the flame traveling to other places. And that's would the you, same thing in these two cases you just you just what, mentioned. What I'm what I'm thinking may be going on is you may actually be looking at um the subsequent wagon mound judgment. So to give you guys a little bit of background, there's a there's the wagon mound case that was that is sort of the the leading uh case for for foreseeability right where their lordship stated the, the foreseeability test um and procedurally that case was then remanded back to the lower court for further proceedings and in those further proceedings uh they were held liable again um for exactly the reason that rudolph is saying um but in the House of Lords case that we ref that we refer to, um, their lordships actually said that the uh, sequence of events, as it was described to them in the record below, was not foreseeable, and therefore uh, they did they did not hold the ship owner liable. Because that's that's the key piece of this is that the ship owner was the defendant in the wagon mound case okay so the the argue, the theory of liability is that the ship owner discharged the oil and they should have known that there was welding that could that could ignite it right so right. and that and that was what their lordship said was unforeseeable that the that the welding would ignite the oil that the ship was was discharging. Okay, um, so uh, I have a private message. Is this why you referred to the reasonable man test as intuition? I mean, I think that I think that this is part of it, right? But again, torts are all part and parcel of one big, not terribly happy family of law. Um, so <laughs> what other questions do we have about the, uh, what, what Ward, I think, very uh, aptly called the daftness test? So do we have any other questions about the daftness test? <laughs> no? Nothing more. Okay, then we're going to move on. The last question that judges ask is, was the type of damage 
reasonably foreseeable. Okay, I have a private message that came in right as I was getting ready. What is it about? The Daphnis test is the second, the second question that judges asked, was the way in which the external factor caused the damage reasonably foreseeable? Okay, so that, that's just, that's me being funny um, or, you know, trying. Uh, the third question that the judges ask is, was the type of damage reasonably foreseeable? Was the type of damage reasonably foreseeable? And this means that we have to figure out what the category of the damage is. And there's some room for judges to exercise some discretion because how they draw the boundaries matters. So they can draw the boundaries very narrowly, right? So they can say that um, we are asking the question of whether it was likely that whether it was reasonably foreseeable that this negligent act would cut off your leg, okay? Or they can draw the boundaries very broadly and they can ask, is, uh, is it reasonably foreseeable that this negligent act would cause harm to your person, okay? There are three types of damage. So private question, the first thing asked is if it is reasonably foreseeable. All of these are questions about reasonable foreseeability, okay? But they're all about different things being reasonably foreseeable. So the first one is, is the source of danger reasonably foreseeable? Is this a thing that can harm someone? The second is, is this, is this a reasonable foresee, reasonably foreseeable way of being harmed? So this is what I'm calling the daftness test. And this one, and the last one, the one that we're talking about now is, is it reasonably foreseeable that you would be harmed this way, right? That this harm would occur. So the broadest way to categorize damage is as one of three types, harm to the person, so that's your body, okay? Harm to your property, so that's, you know, the damage to your car or your house, and pure economic damage, okay? So if you are, if your damage that is done falls into category A, but the judge decides that the only foreseeable damage from this negligent act would be category B, you get nothing. You have to have a match between the damage that's done and the damage that's foreseeable, okay? And at the very least, it has to be of this very broad type. Um, a defendant-friendly judge can narrow these definitions, right? And say, okay, we're only going to allow you to recover for, uh, you know, the damage caused by, um, you know, for, for the damage to your um, upper spine, right? So let's say that we have a, a car wreck, right? A high-speed car wreck, and you are, you suffer whiplash, so it's damage to your, your upper spine and your neck, but you also have your legs crushed because the engine of your car gets shoved into the passenger compartment. And a judge can say that these are two different types of damages. And depending on the facts could say that only one of them was reasonably foreseeable, okay? Do we think that's likely? No, but it is possible. Okay, so let me give you uh, a couple of examples. The Warren's case, Warren, Warren's versus Scruton. Um, the plaintiff is injured. The injury is to their finger, but because of the finger injury, they develop an infection and the infection actually damages their eyes. 
do not ask me to explain the medical uh, basis for this, but this is the story that is told in the judgment, right? Damage to the finger causes damage to the eyes. Do we think that this is reasonably foreseeable? Seeing a no, 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 no. no. Their lordships disagreed. Their lordships say both of these are harm to the person. And it is not, it's not necessary that the specific damage be foreseeable as long as the type of damage is foreseeable. Okay. So repeat that. Repeat that again. Repeat that again. Sure. It is not necessary that the specific damage harmed be foreseeable as long as the type of damage is foreseeable. And again, right? They can define type of damage very broadly, body, property, economics, or they can, they can choose to define it more narrowly. So let's take a look at another example, right? We have a doctor and the doctor is treating a patient um, and gives the, doc gives the patient bad advice about the state of the patient's health and the, the likelihood of recovery. Because of this advice, the patient goes to their solicitor and agrees to settle a personal injury case that they have for some small sum. Had the doctor given the patient the correct advice, the settlement would have been much larger. So the plaintiff is now attempting to, now attempts to sue the doctor to recover the difference between what he actually settled his case for and what his case was worth. Who wins? Sally Ann, you, you're unmuted. The you have- patient. Sorry. No, Colette, you, uh, you were saying something? I said the patient would- Okay, why? Pardon me? Why? Oh, why? <laughs> okay, if I can clearly remember the case. Um, what, what would have happened is that the doctor, the amount that they would have gained if uh, um, they had waited and gotten the right, um, what do you call it now? Settlement. Set, no, not settlement. If they had gotten the right advice, oh yeah, 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 they would not have settled for less. Mm -hmm. And um, based on that fact, um, that is why they would have. I, I think they should have won, and that okay. should have been. Hey, the but thing. didn't you say that they that they brought a personal injury suit? Yes. So wouldn't the defendant win? So. Uh, why do you think the defendant would win, Michael? Um, is it because the, um, the, what they're suing for was not what the actual, um, uh, what the actual result was? The, the fact that they're suing for personal injury, but really they this up for the economic loss? That's, so, so, um, so economic loss is still a form of personal injury, but what you're, what you're saying is that the damage was, um, that the damage they suffered was an economic loss, but the as I but the foreseeable damage of medical negligence is harm to the person. Is that is that what you're saying? Um, no, because for me, I I was thinking that if you were talking about how if the doctor had given them the right advice, they would have gotten the the 
they're suing for the balance. But the, um, but I'm understanding you're saying that they brought a personal injury case. And I was trying to apply what you said before, where yeah. you were talking about how um, there are the, the three different types and how the judges would not um, award the, the plaintiff if they had deemed that um, the damages fall, fell under another type and not the one that they actually brought the suit for. But when you said that they were that they brought a personal injury case, but they but they but they want to. Okay. Um, no, no. Let me let me let me pause you because I think I, I think I understand where where we've gotten confused. Um, the question is not the different. It's not about the form of the suit. Okay. We we've dispensed with the forms. At least we say we have. Um, what matters is what type of damage would have been foreseeable from the negligence okay and so like what would the reasonable man think would happen to someone who suffered this negligence and the reasonable man so say their lordships would have expected that um medical negligence uh medical negligence results in harm to the person. And so since the claim was for economic loss, they said that it was too remote. Okay. Uh, let, let me, let me check the chat. Cause I see you guys have been active while I've been sort of looking into the camera. Um, okay. Uh, Shasia says, how would they estimate how much he would have settled for instead had he been given better advice and waited we're actually going to talk about that next week when we talk about damages and sort of how damages get est estimated, but there are mechanisms in place to estimate that. So, um, been asked to repeat. Okay, so the analysis is, what would a reasonable person have expected the harm to look like given the negligence that occurred? Okay. And in this case, the case actually is called Stevens versus Bermondsey Hospital, if you want to go and look it up. Stevens versus Bermondsey Hospital. Um, in that case, the uh, in that case, the um, the harm that was expected was from medical negligence, and their lordship said that that harm is harm to the person. The case name is Stevens versus Bermondsey Hospital. Stevens versus Bermondsey Hospital. Okay. Um, okay. So, What questions do you have about this before we wrap things up? Okay, so I think I'm still a little lost. So you are saying that the that the Lord their lordships decided that because it's a medical case, that means that is um, harm to the person. No, uh, from no, they said they decided that the foreseeable harm from medical negligence is harm to the person. This was not a harm to the person case. This was an economic loss case. And that's why the plaintiff lost. Okay. All right. Okay. So it's not, it's, it's not that they are categorizing this as a medical negligence as a as a harm to the person case it's that they are saying we expect that when doctors give bad advice that what happens to their patients is harm to their person we do not expect an economic loss okay um so okay so given the nature of the of the negligence then is how the judges decide what type of damages to award. Yes. Okay, I think I got you. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. 
So the first, uh, the first case, for those of you following along at home, the first case was Warrens v. Scrutton. The second case was Stevens versus Bermondsey Hospital. Okay. Um, all right. So we are out of time, and I hope you will forgive me if I say I am Zoomed out. <laughs> um, I have been in Zoom since 9 a.m. nonstop. So uh, um, I am going to wrap this up and uh, I will see you guys over the, um, over the uh, course of the week and we'll take care. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to deal with impression. something. Um, Thank you. Have a good evening. See y'all. So take care, guys. You too, sir. And bye.